Thank you everyone for being here today. We'd love to get started. Um, and just to make sure that you're in the right place, uh, this panel is about the Blue Highways. Um, and we are so honored to have all of you join us today and have this incredible panel join us as well. Um, to get us started, I will pass it off to Paul, uh, who will be the moderator for this session and who will do the introductions. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Farhana. So whatever name you call it, whatever name we've given it, whether it's Manahata, New Amsterdam, Nueva York, or the Big Oyster, the history of this city has been written at the water's edge. And though at times we forget that we were once the world's greatest port city, at the water's edge we began, and to the water's edge we always seem to return. Whether it's delivering on the promise of low carbon energy, or handling our most intractable logistics challenges, i.e. the monumental waste export plan, or moving the thousands of tons of cement and stone and steel that are required to raise our shoreline and harden it, this city has consistently and reliably looked to its waterways for solutions to its existential problems. At this session, we'll, emer we'll examine the emerging blue highway, the replacement of truck miles with nautical miles, to address yet another urgent challenge confronting our city. And on today's panel, we're fortunate to have the administration's thought leaders in freight planning and waterborne movement. Natasha Avanesians is a senior advisor for infrastructure to Deputy Mayor Mira Joshi. Denise Mendez, EIT, is the director of freight mobility for New York City DOT, and Jen Sun is the Executive Vice President for Planning at New York City EDC. And each, in their own way, Natasha, Denise, and Jen are themselves writing another chapter in that long history of our port city. But I'm gonna let them tell you more about who they are and what they're passionate about as we dive into our discussion. And I might add that their bios are also in the program if you wanna learn more. Um, Natasha, I think we're going to start with you. Is that okay? Sure. So the city has seen a steep rise in e-commerce and on-demand delivery post-pandemic. What are the impacts of this increased freight movement on the city, on so-called last mile communities, and how is the administration looking to address them? And we can talk about this if you'd like, but I'm curious if the advent of congestion tolling is going to change the calculus for delivery fleets and encourage alternative modes like waterborne freight. Please jump in. Thank you, and thanks to the Waterfront Alliance and, and for all of you for hosting us today. And I think we can all admit that we have a very inspiring view right behind us when we're talking about the Blue Highway. So it's a really great venue to be at. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone in this room, no matter what your knowledge base is of the freight industry. Um, but COVID-19 and the pandemic has certainly accelerated the e-commerce trend and has really defined and solidified what we know to be on-demand delivery. Um, whether you're purchasing clothes or food or now even medicine nowadays, we're really expecting these things to arrive at our doorsteps um, within a matter of days, if not hours. And I know DOT has been following this very closely and has estimated that about 80% of households right now receive at least one package a week, 20% receive four or more. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. As a new mom, being able to receive diapers within a two hour window um, has its great benefits, especially at two o'clock in the morning. Um, but there are definitely a lot of challenges that the city is facing right now um, because of this increased demand. Um, and that really namely is rooted in the fact that freight is, 90% of our freight moves via truck. So what does that mean? So that means added congestion on our streets. Um, but it doesn't just impact, you know, how I get from here to the Upper West Side and slowing me down by an extra 10 minutes, but it also means more wear and tear on our roads and bridges. So, you know, specifically for the Department of Transportation, increasing those maintenance cycles that we're seeing, and you're seeing a lot more wear and tear. This also leads to increased um, economic loss revenue. Uh, so I know the Partnership for New York has estimated that we lose about $20 billion a year in economic revenue uh, due to congestion. 
Um, and it also increased the conflict at the curb lane, right? So we see a lot more double parking, parking on sidewalks. Um, so increases in, in safety issues for a lot of pedestrians and, bike, and cyclists as well. Um, so right now, the blue highway, how do we sort of shift from a very truck-reliant freight network to sort of releasing that valve and allowing more freight via, via boat and barge is really critical at this moment. To that end, Jen, do you want to talk about the type of infrastructure we're likely going to need? Um, what does the city need to do to ensure this infrastructure is going to be operational, going to be available in a very crowded city, in a very crowded waterfront? Yeah, it's a big challenge for us. Um, obviously, after the city has been investing for so long in bringing public waterfront access back to New Yorkers and really you know, prioritizing for a long time, um, recreation at the waterfront. I think we're at a moment where we rec recognize that there's a need to also prioritize our remaining waterfront assets for maritime and industrial use and to really support moving freight differently in the city, almost sort of analogous to the housing crisis. I feel like we have to take a hard look at city government, at the publicly owned and managed waterfront landings, whether it's heliports like the downtown Manhattan heliport the 34th Street heliport, and also our passenger, ferry passenger landings and terminals in new ways to really think about how to make them multi-use, multimodal, um, in the same way that we look at public sites for housing. How do we get the most um, in terms of achieving important policy goals? And so part of the reason why we're here is um, to really look at the city-owned EDC-managed passenger ferry landings and heliports and think about how to um, bring them online, it, oftentimes in partnership with the private sector um, because of a lot of deferred maintenance, um, neglect over time. A lot of this infrastructure needs significant public and private investment in order to make them ready to receive freight deliveries. The kind of infrastructure that we're, we're, is needed and that we're thinking about is to either support freight delivery by passenger ferries and or by barge. And you can imagine that depending on the size of the freight, the weight of the freight, and how it's delivered, whether it's by electric truck, van, cargo bike, or cargo trike, the kind of infrastructure that needs to be in place on the water side and in the upland area can be quite different depending on the scale. But in general, the kind of waterfront infrastructure that EDC is planning to design and implement, in part with the federal um, MARAD grant, is um, a combination of spud barges or floating barges that provide sort of that transition from vessels to the upland area, gangways so that you can actually move freight from the vessels to the upland area, and then working closely with DOT and in some instances with private operators in making the upland area available and ready for staging, even storage, of um, cargo bikes, charging equipment, providing amenities for the delivery workers so that we can manage the flow of last mile deliveries and introducing that into the street network in a way where we're really minimizing conflicts with greenway users. That's the other dimension as we start thinking about the interaction between the water and the on-street network is that in many of these locations that we want to activate, there's existing greenways and waterfront esplanades that we have to respect and work with. So those are some of the operational challenges, is how to put the infrastructure in place to manage that traffic flow. That's good. Denise, jump in. Yeah, I was just going to add uh, to a lot of the excellent points that have already been made. Um, <clears throat> At DOT, we're also actively thinking about our bike network, our truck network connections into uh, and, and, and connecting to these landings or these ports. Um, you know, Jed alluded to sort of the concept of a micro hub or transloading areas to be able to break the freight down into smaller, more stage, more um, uh, nimble um, sort of um, volume so that we can use either by walking or by cargo bikes. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so we are actively creating the system and the foundational blocks to support the transloading from marine to other last mile delivery modes. And so this is where we're sort of teeing up a lot of our um, coordination uh, as well. Denise, to that point, 
the best laid plans, the best infrastructure in the world without motivated shippers, without a motivated, I guess, private sector to leverage this infrastructure becomes meaningless. You work with a lot of fleets around the city, truck-based fleets, I would guess, largely. Are there motivated shippers out there? Are there people ready to try this, to pilot this? Absolutely. Um, in fact, it's... Um it's in their best interest. Um, we know that uh, in the next 20 years, we're expected to see about a 68% increase in freight tonnage coming into our region. We really cannot uh, absorb that on our roadway and our street infrastructure, so it behooves us to really think about diversifying that mode. Um, and so even if you um, you know, create or activate our waterways, you're still gonna need um, someone to be able to make that delivery in the last mile. And that can be by an EV truck, it can be by a cargo bike, or um, some other means, right? So um, they are motivated to do that. We, we do think that congestion pricing creates additional signals and pressures uh, for them to sort of think about their bottom line and sort of shifting their operations to reduce costs as well. Um, so it's also in their best interest uh, to do that. And you know, based on some uh, initial sort of responses from the solicitations we released last fall, we're seeing a healthy response and robust response to the city's vision uh, for activating our waterways. And that is really critical and important. They need to be at the table um, as we're sort of thinking about the policy making as well. Natasha, um, jump in, but g given the scarcity of infrastructure, mm -hmm. can we get to scale? Is there a way to scale this in New York City? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think to Denise's, um, you know, just building off of what Denise said, and can we really get the private sector to the table? I definitely think so. We have congestion pricing coming down the pike. So for peak hours, small and medium trucks are going to be charged between 20 and $35 every time they enter the congestion pricing zone. Um, so that's a lot for them to build into their calculus and how they're doing business. And also, as I mentioned earlier, congestion not only costs the city and the region um, lost economic revenue, it's also not good for the private operators, too, if they're slowing down, if the truckers are slowing down when they're getting into midtown Manhattan specifically. Um, in terms of scale, I think... Obviously, we're city of islands. We do have very limited infrastructure. But in terms of our freight network, I think it's really critical that it's not just about taking trucks off the road, but it's also about building redundancy in our freight network. What we saw in Baltimore a really terrible tragedy a couple months ago. Um, it's really critical that you know we not only have um, improved roadways for trucks to use, but we also expand our rail capacity. And of course, Blue Highway, what we're talking about today. Um, and what we saw in, in Baltimore, too, if we didn't have those rail lines and didn't have those, um, those partners to kind of step up and, and uh, a number of the Blue Highway um, operator, barge operators, too, to kind of swoop in, um, the economy could have been at a really big, the regional economy there could have been at a big standstill, so. Got it. As we look at the potential unfolding of the Blue Highways, there are going to be impacts. Mm -hmm. You mentioned greenways. You mentioned people who live near greenways. Um, we've spent the last quarter century building parks on the waterfront, something that I was very much in favor of, but I'm also a freight advocate, and I'm starting to see some of the failed thinking in putting parks everywhere. This is inevitably going to result in pushback, whether it's from parks users or bikers or people who live near potential ports, whether they're ferries or whether they're new freight ports. What about the environmental justice implications on the other side of this in the last mile communities? Can, Jen, can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I want to address your question about scale, too, because yeah. I think they're also related, because I think it's really important just to take a moment, not to deflect the question, which I'll yeah. get to. But I, I think there's an important um, opportunity, you know, with EDC and the city now taking over operational control yeah. of the Red Hook Piers. Um, you know, as a result of this big announcement last week, in partnership with the Port Authority and with the state, um, EDC and the city are taking over control of Red Hook Piers, specifically Pier 7 through 12, so the Brooklyn waterfront just south of Brooklyn Bridge Park, inclusive of the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal. Um, part of the reason why we made that move and are making a significant capital investment 
um, to begin to address a lot of the deferred maintenance in those piers is a recognition of how important the Red Hook Container Terminal has been as a local, regional, international container terminal, um, how important it is for the city to continue to invest in its future and its expansion to not only handle more international containers um, you know, that are um, delivered to the city from the Caribbean and from Latin America, but also its real promise in supporting Blue Highway um, and Blue Highway reaching scale so that it can really become a cost-effective, competitive, and reliable service that more shippers will choose over trucks as a way of moving freight from New Jersey, from ports like Port Jersey, Port Newark, um, into Red Hook, but then um, either those deliveries making a last mile, um, you know, sort of delivery into Brooklyn, and or for Red Hook to really become a key node for then supporting um, last mile deliveries into Manhattan and into Brooklyn. And it has the upland areas and a lot of the cargo handling equipment already in order to support that. But a real focus working with the operator who's here is to really decarbonize um, you know, with the goal and understanding that there are real impacts to adjacent environmental justice communities. It's an imperative for the city and the private sector together to really invest in um, replacing diesel trucks, forklifts, cargo handling equipment, cranes um, on site with um, electric or other um, you know, hydrogen fueled uh, zero emission equipment. And so that's important for Red Hook, but as a model for doing that in other smaller landings at passenger ferry landings as well, of looking at, really looking at investing in shore power infrastructure. And then I think increasingly looking at how we can support the private sector in a lot of the R&D that they're investing in, um, in developing electric tugs, barges, and vessels. So I think that's sort of the next frontier to really reach the goal of this new, um, mode of logistics really truly being zero emission. Yeah. Can I ask a question about the city's relationship to the private sector in this regard? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of inducements. I'm sure there are incentives. What, what levers do you think the city has and will have going forward to induce shippers to start moving product from highway to water? Are there levers that we haven't talked about or that are being explored that you can share? I think we are looking at other cities that have taken sort of additional steps from a regulatory perspective yeah. about how to strike the right balance between incentives um, and you know, chasing as much sort of federal funding as we can and bring it into the city and into private investment and leveraging that, but also through regulation about compelling um, either existing last mile facilities and potentially new facilities that are developed in the future um, to have to do better and actually adopt you know, zero emission um, equipment, trucks, and really take a hard look at developing traffic plans and operation plans at fundamentally changing the way in which they receive deliveries and ship freight Are out. we suggesting performance standards for last mile facilities? We are. Can I get you on the record? Yes. All yeah, right. we are exploring that for um, sure. Yeah. I think that's enormously important. You reference Red Hook. Mike knows it well. There's over a million square feet of last mile facilities yeah. in essentially a peninsula with, with a working waterfront. Are there ways that come to mind in the bigger plan for the Red Hook waterfront to begin to induce the use of water by some of those million square feet of users? I think the approach with Red Hook is for the city in partnership with Mike is really demonstrating that Blue Highway is a viable transportation mode. And in partnership with you know, companies that you're working with, Paul, right? Yeah. And, and other consortiums that are coming together that are bringing together what we call the ecosystem of shippers, um, vessel operators, um, micromobility equipment owners and operators, and customers. And then the city. So it's this sort of multi-party um, collaboration that needs to happen and stitching that all together to work in concert in the same direction. But I think Red Hook is you know, an incredible opportunity for us to demonstrate its viability, um, 
working with multiple companies. I don't think it's just working with Mike alone and yeah. putting a pilot into action, but testing different models of container on barge, um, cargo bikes on passenger ferry vessels, and showing the range of what's possible as a way of then um, really showing proof of concept yeah. to bring along other last mile facility developers and operators as well as their clients. Acknowledging that, you know, we probably have the most control over what we can do at Red Hook, obviously, and yeah. really turbocharging that. Yeah. And then hopefully by example, through again, sort of regulation and incentives, um, influence the private logistic operators in Red Hook to do the same. Can we stay on Red Hook for a minute? Yeah. Denise, jump in. Well, I actually was gonna take it a little bit sort of broader, okay. if that's okay. Um, we talk a lot about Red Hook, um, but we do need to create sort of a hub um, and sort of node system that allows the flexibility and uh, giving options to operators to be able to serve their customers. And so as we continue to think about um, you know, Red Hook, it's really in relation to the other assets that could be activated to really create a system that allows, the, gives the confidence to the industry to be able to run a service that's reliable. Um, so I want to make sure that we're pointing that out as well. Um, and on the DOT end, we also are advancing several initiatives to help um, clean uh, truck operators to shift their deliveries or their, their vehicles to cleaner yeah. um, battery electric vehicle. They're putting a lot of investment on the other end as well. We're also thinking about um, standing up incentive programs for cargo bike operators as well. Uh, so we see the opportunity as sort of like really inf sort of injecting a lot of sort of public inf infrastructure uh, investments, but also on the vehicle technology piece to really help the industry. Um, this is really a paradigm shift. It's gonna require a lot of investment to really see um, sort of the outcomes that we're going after as well. Got it. So you mentioned <laughs> giving confidence to the industry mm -hmm. at large <clears throat> and the shippers. How about confidence to communities that this is gonna help address, ameliorate their concerns about congestion how does Red Hook's unusual because half the population of Red Hook lives within less than a quarter of a mile from a working waterfront. How does that community become engaged in shaping this process, in shaping the outcomes, in building in the kind of confidence and assurances that this won't add to more congestion, that there won't be unforeseen circumstances and consequences? Um, yeah, it, so specific to Red Hook, you know, we're, we'll be kicking off a... So in Red Hook, we'll be kicking off a, a really robust engagement process. Part of that being about bringing people within the campus behind the fence to really understand, you know, what is happening today, why the Red Hook container terminal is important, what freight is being, you know, barged um, into Red Hook, the number of trucks that are being taken off of roadways as a result, um, how many more trucks can be taken off roads if we invest in the right way in Red Hook in terms of the equipment, and then also thinking about cold storage. So a part of the announcement last week was also about making an initial public investment in cold storage facilities, recognizing that if we actually want to reduce the amount of barging of containers to New Jersey, for that to be broken down and stored in New Jersey, but then trucked back into the city for final delivery, in order for us to eliminate that final truck move back into the city from New Jersey warehouses, additional investments in dry and cold storage facilities will also be crucial. So it's thinking about sort of that whole picture um, in order to really drive down tr um, truck traffic. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like engaging the community, I think it's a real sort of like, you know, co-learning and co-designing together. Yeah. Um, to really understand how is freight moving today? How can it be different in the future? And as a part of that, really inviting the community to understand, um, again, sort of the logistics, but also provide input in, in what kinds of conflicts we need to be mindful of in designing the right solutions. And part of it is probably you know, solutions and, tr and through design. And I think a lot of it is through operations. Yeah. And I, uh, I go ahead, please. Just add to um, 
you know, there's been a lot of work also in the Red Hook Pier's neighboring infrastructure, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway reconstruction project that the city is undertaking. And we've been conducting a very robust um, public visioning process, not only for folks in the Brooklyn Heights area for the reconstruction there, but also folks south of there and north of there, and um, Red Hook and, and the community partners being a very important piece of that puzzle. Um, so there's a lot of sort of lessons learned and a lot of information that, that we're sharing with the Red Hook team um, as, as you guys advance the master planning. But also, and, and I'll let Denise um, showcase the great work that her team is doing too, there's a Red Hook truck and traffic study that's underway uh, that DOT is leading and, and soliciting a lot of really helpful information from the community about the impacts of last mile facilities there. Um, and in addition, also looking at doing a truck redesign that was uh, mandated by the New York City Council. So there's a lot of different puzzle pieces that are uh, moving that you know I know Denise can talk about, but you know we're hoping to to get out some really good recommendations for the community in the next couple months. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I won't spend too much time no, 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 on please. that, but you've been seeing some of those screens flashing up around sort of our evolving and a wide ranging toolkit. It's going to take everything for us to really tackle this challenge. Um, and so we're doing that head on. We're leading the nation in many ways on a lot of our freight initiatives. I do want to also call to attention sort of the opportunity for workforce development, um, particularly for uh, maybe having some of these folks be a part of the solution or maybe participate in the job creation. And so um, I think there's some opportunities there as well. Um, and then back to some of the other carrots, uh, you know, the city, um, is also mandated by city council as well to sort of develop an industrial strategic action plan. Um, and so that is uh, another opportunity to sort of think about, um, you know, future proofing or integrating sustainable freight practices um, and, and, and zoning to, to the extent that we can do that. Uh, secondly, um, you know, there could be opportunities to look at tax incentives. We've seen other states leverage things like that to help to spur the industry and provide support if you're going to be investing in sort of, you know, marine freight or other things. So we are casting a really broad net um, to really examine what other levels, levers the city uh, can, can uh, deploy. Got it. We're going to wrap in a minute, but before we do, two things. We talk a lot about housing on the waterfront. Obviously, that is one of the pressures on freight, and it's one of the pressures on the working waterfront. It has been for years. Are there examples that anyone on this panel can point to from anywhere else in the world of the coexistence, the peaceful coexistence, I should say, of freight and housing or shipping and housing? Does electrification mean anything in terms of making this coexistence easier or more seamless? Um, and is it something the city is studying? Is it something that you're going to want to study? Yes, to I, I think almost all of that, meaning that we are looking for those precedents of um, you know industry and housing coexisting. Um, it is very possible that we actually are going to be trying to pioneer this model. I think in order for us to think seriously about how housing can work with a working waterfront, we have to decarbonize then in order to create the, this environment, the healthy environment for that to be possible for people to be living next to an active container terminal to you know a blue highway landing. Um, but I think you know with a sort of twin crises or really a triple threat of housing, of economic development and inv investing in maritime industry and jobs and our supply chain and then climate, um, that's sort of the, our, ch our challenge at Red Hook as a model is how do we tackle all three together through a master planning process with a lot of engagement from community members, but also from industry and in helping us really figure out the best solutions that we can put forward here. Um, yeah. Jen, are you suggesting we should throw out 100 years of land use policy and zoning in this city? It's okay uh, if you are. I no, mean, I, I support no, you. I, I can I, get behind that. I'm not suggesting that, you know, necessarily that with Red Hook and looking at how we might be you know, putting into the question of whether you really need an IBZ policy or a different set of policies and invest investments in order to make industry and housing work together. I think that will be the open question for the project ahead of us. That's good. That's yeah. good. Thanks. Um, 
What's next for Blue Highways? Um, this is an open question, but Jen, if you want to start. We're at a point of inflection. Where are we headed? I think it's to, you know, part of the reason why we're here is, um, you know, we talked about sort of our individual agency efforts, but I think one thing that I'd want the audience to appreciate also is that we're working very closely in coordination with each other too. Recognizing, and this is something that we've heard from the private sector, that it can be bewildering for companies to know how to engage the city um, in taking on novel projects like that. And so part of our work together is also how to streamline um, government processes to make it easier for us to, to partner with us um, and to take the next step of, of rationalizing how do we provide access to landings to multiple companies in a way that actually works when different shippers and customers might have very different needs in terms of delivery windows, time of day deliveries, frequency of deliveries. Um, so I think the next sort of phase is figuring out that choreography, um, our role in supporting that in government, but also recognizing that there might be private companies, technology providers, logistics companies that are as equipped in coming up with the right solutions in partnership with us. Thank you. Denise, what's next? Uh, a lot of all of that. Um, <clears throat> so connecting, again, the Blue Highways program with a lot of the synergies that we're seeing, uh, particularly with uh, our last mile delivery program. So we've uh, introduced new rules to formalize um, cargo bike operations within the city, and that gives a much needed clarity for folks to think about so their entire supply chain. Uh, that is the foundational building block for our MicroHubs pilot program, which we'll be launching later this year. That really helps to facilitate the transloading of goods from a um, you know truck or even that's coming in from uh, by water uh, to a more sustainable delivery vehicle for the last 50 feet or last mile of the delivery. Um, the other component of that is really also thinking about how our incentive programs can really be uh, matched to provide that ecosystem. So we're encouraging off our deliveries. You know, wouldn't it be nice to sort of sync that up also with some of the Blue Highways initiative as well? And then also thinking about how we scale our programs. They're all starting to speak to each other and we really want to see more of that. Um, what we do here also has regional implications. So that's another layer um, that we're actively thinking about and also talking to our partners across the water because there could be some benefits that go beyond New York City as well. Beautiful. Natasha, you wanna wrap? Sure, I think um, the one thing that I, we touched on a little bit, um, but it's also you know, a big question is how we're gonna pay for all of these capital upgrades. Um, you know, upgrading piers in the waterfront is not um, is not an easy feat. I think from some, some of our smaller piers, we're estimating a couple million dollars to much larger piers in Midtown Manhattan, a couple hundred million dollars. So in addition to partnering with the private sector, really exploring what kind of public-private partnership models are out there. Um, we're also really looking to the federal government as well. Um, the deputy mayor's office um, stood up at the beginning of the administration um, a federal infrastructure task force. Um, and through that, the city has been more aggressive than ever for seeking federal funds to do these types of transformational projects that are just a little bit out of our, our price point as just funded by the city alone. Um, and I know DOT and, and EDC led by Denise and Jen, we recently submitted um, a grant for about $500 million to the EPA Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program uh, to do a lot of the stuff that we're talking about and to really create and solidify this hub and spoke model, everything from blue highway upgrades to incentivizing cargo bikes for small businesses and, and establishing these micro hubs. So we're going to continue to be really aggressive and partnering with the Biden administration as well to, to make sure that we all, uh, we can afford this and accelerate the progress. Thanks. So I think we have some time for questions and I think I'm, I'll start with you. you uh, I don't know if there's a microphone though. I think it may be coming around and if you could just Say who you are. Hi, I'm Dr. Joy Reidenberg, and I'm here representing Gotham Whale. I am a scientist who studies whales, and I can tell you from my experience, the biggest issue that you haven't addressed is the other 99% of the miles, which is uh, coming through the waters. What mitigation efforts will you be doing to try to cut down on the number of whales that have been hit by ships coming in 
particularly now that we know we're going to have even more ships coming in. Uh, I have been very actively working in the uh, necropsy field, you know, dissecting these whales when they come in to find out cause of death. And almost every whale I've dissected in the past four years has been a ship strike. That's a lot of whales. We're getting something like 30 some odd whales in New York alone per year being struck by ships and an almost equal number in New Jersey. Uh, it's, it's an epidemic. So I'd like to know what solutions you're proposing since the blue highway will now be expanding. This is not just deer on the highway. We're talking about major damage to the ships too. It's not just the whales suffering. So please. Thanks. I think that's a critical issue. I think in many ways it is probably beyond the purview of the people on this panel, but I don't want to presuppose that. Jen Sun is our, our expert on all things in the natural world, so I don't know if you want to jump in. Not on whales, though, unfortunately. I mean, I think what comes to mind, you know, without um, speaking out of turn, you made the point that I think shippers would be motivated to be thoughtful, right, about shipping routes. And so I think the point that you've raised is that as we work with shippers and customers to define what those shipping routes are, is taking that very issue into consideration. And how, as we are operationalizing this service, can we take into consideration natural habitat, natural wildlife, in order to make sure that um, we're minimizing the risk of those co collisions happening? Um, because, you know, for the sake of natural habitat, but also for shippers to avoid the damage and the hazards of that happening as well. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, how about in the way in the back? <laughs> Thank you very much. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you're talking about um, levers that the city can push onto the general commercial entities that are working moving cargo. Um, one lever that I'm not hearing at all is standardization. I hear you talk about micro, uh, micro EVs and uh, uh, you know, UPS trucks and other trucks and stuff. Um, I would very much believe that if we set a standard width for cargo that gets delivered into New York City that we can achieve efficiencies that get rid of all the problems that you guys are discussing here. Um, containers are eight foot wide, and that eight foot width um, restriction uh, actually developed the incredible efficiencies we have. If you pick a somewhat narrower dimension for universal cargo delivery in New York City, I'm sure that we can also achieve incredible efficiency increases. Thanks. Can you just introduce yourself? Tell I'm us your Rick, name. Rick Van Hemmen. Thank you. Denise, you deal with shippers every day. You deal with truckers. Has that crossed your radar yet? And your question was regarding the width of trucks, generally speaking, or just a palletized cargo? Yeah. Um, I think it really also boils down to sort of the cost to deliver that. So that means you'll have. That's what that's that's what I've what I've heard generally speaking about sort of the transition. You're saying that you would require two two vehicles essentially to be able to move the same amount of freight.
It's an interesting concept. I think we'll, I'll need to like understand a little bit more. I'm not entirely clear um, just yet, but um, it's an interesting concept we can definitely uh, explore further. Thank you. Um, got a question back there. Get a mic there. Um, I, I'm just curious to know how that would actually work. Would DHL get a peer and UPS get a peer and Amazon get a peer, or would one entity control the peer? How does that, how do you imagine that working? What about that, Jen? I'm yeah. going to pitch it to you. Well, for city landings and um, city managed landings, um, our approach is that these are publicly accessible, and so they should not be exclusive for a particular company to use. Um, obviously, that's easier to say in sort of theory and concept than in sort of how you operationalize that. But that is the guiding principle for how we're approaching this, non-exclusive. Um, and so I think it's just working with each company, but then together with all the companies that are interested in making deliveries to the same landing of how we choreograph those deliveries in a way that works for different companies. And maybe, you know, that's a very simplistic kind of approach. There might be as a next step having to think about you know, if um, multiple companies want the same delivery windows, what then? In terms of how to prioritize which companies get access, we're not quite there yet, but we anticipate that those are some of the issues that we have to address. That would be a good problem to have, Jen, yeah, in the hierarchy be. of problems, yeah. right? Yeah. Who else? Oh, I think we got a question back there. Hi, I'm going to make a recommendation, not ask a question. So I'm Carlina Salguero um, from Portside, New York. Uh, we were founded to make actually a mixed-use maritime center with B2B services to the working waterfront and community programming. So we understand this blending idea you're talking about in Red Hook. So the recommendation I want to make, what I think has been missing, is there's been no incentive um, by the city, and if it's tax, it'll need the state involvement to incentivize maritime use on private property. So the SMIA and the S IBZ and M zones allow for that activity, but they don't actually encourage use of the water. Mm -hmm. So the city, you know, did at one point say if you're going to rezone, you had to provide public access, but nothing was done to incentivize maritime use on M zone property. So consequently, in Red Hook, we have all these last mile facilities that popped up right on the water, and there was no incentive for them to put it on the water. And so that could still happen, but I think that's a really a missing piece. So the, the program that you're working on with the six you know, ports around the city is just a drop in the bucket. A lot of these facilities, because we had a working waterfront everywhere in the city, are already on the water or near the water. And if they could be incentivized themselves to immediately get it or, or, or spread out of there, you would grow your marine highway faster. Because otherwise, you're, tr you're just addressing, and I'm not criticizing the effort, by the way. I think it's important that what you're doing, but it is like so small and there. So what can you do? What can you do, EDC and state partners, to provide incentives to use, to put maritime uses on these properties? To make the Amazons and the everybody else like do it there, too. Yeah, we share your interest, I think, um, in not only the publicly controlled waterfront areas being a real like hub for blue highway activity, but also for privately owned waterfront assets, too. I would agree that we would like to see, ideally, that a lot of the last mile facilities in Red Hook or in Hunts Point that have access to the water actually use Blue Highway to ship their freight, receive you know, deliveries by water, ship things out by water. I just don't think we're there yet. Um, but I think you know, our focus continues to be to really continue to work with you know, logistic companies, shippers, customers, micromobility operators who really believe in this vision are investing private dollars to actually put pilots in place and get pilots underway to show that this service is viable, to make a service actually available, whether it's by barge, by passenger ferry, so that there's an actual viable option for um, you know, those last mile facility tenants to actually make a different choice to receive or ship goods by water instead. Um, and then I think over time, again, either through regulation or incentives, by establishing that there's a viable service requiring that more and more companies use that. And I think the ideal state is that we're so successful in showing that this service is as, as competitive and, and superior 
because not only is it business oriented and economically viable from a logistical perspective, but also for an environmental perspective, that companies will actually choose to be in these waterfront facilities for those very reasons. And that a lot of the last mile facilities that are vacant now, you know, there was such a glut of construction during the pandemic that now there's a situation where we have quite a high vacancy rate now in last mile facility op um, warehouses opening without lease commitments. And so I think part of our work is to demonstrate the feasibility of this service and again, attract companies that actually want to use Marine Highway to actually rent space in these waterfront sites and operate out of there. I think that's sort of the ultimate goal. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question and I think it's up front. That's you. <laughs> Um, I just had a question because one of my um, concerns about um, congestion pricing is now going towards blue highways. So if we, is this going to be more cheaper for companies to have freight um, and deliver to the customer? And if it's expensier, what are the regulations being put in place so that the customer is not the one ultimately paying for this increase in pricing? Um, because that would not give the incentive to like other companies to join this type of freight. Yeah, I think the goal is that, or the, the business proposition is for um, you know, logistic companies and customers to think about using Blue Highway service instead as either at least a service that is similar in cost or perhaps cheaper, right? In that they'll be saving on potentially labor um, truck maintenance costs by having fewer trucks that are sitting in congestion and in traffic for making those deliveries. And so hopefully the value proposition is that maybe Blue Highway service could actually be a cheaper service and just as reliable and guaranteeing deliveries um, within the delivery windows that companies have promised. I think also too, not, not specifically Blue Highway focus, but how can we start distributing the amount of freight during peak hours during the day? And I know DOT and Denise are leading off hour delivery incentive programs so that these operators can start delivering these things, whether it's to businesses or different residences during these off peak hours where trucks um, won't have to pay that surcharge in the congestion pricing. And one other thing that I wanted to highlight too, um, we, we've talked so much about sort of the waterfront infrastructure that we're investing in, but I think also importantly, city planning through city of yes, zoning for economic opportunity is also looking at how to support through zoning more micro distribution centers in commercial districts and actually allowing micro hubs in office buildings and or parking garages so that you have um, Amazon have, um, making fewer deliveries to these micro distribution hubs and then that last mile delivery not happening by truck but instead by cargo bike or by walkers instead. So I think that's sort of an important part of this more comprehensive approach is thinking about infrastructure at the water's edge but also in major like central business districts like Manhattan which will be in the congestion zone allowing more of these micro hubs as of right will also be an important um, pressure valve. Thank you. Um, do we have time for, for Hannah? Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Is there a thought to using the success of the Department of Sanitation's uh, waste transfer stations? Essentially, what, 15 years ago, no garbage moved by water and now almost all of it moves by water and no one knows about it and it just happens. So sort of the reverse of that, just planning, a lot of planning and execution for essentially what you have truck to barge to rail, uh, sort of reversing that so as a successful model that it's, it was new 15 years ago and now it's just yeah. how we do things in New York City. <laughs> I, I just want to point out that was not done painlessly. There were lawsuits. No, 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 I'm not saying it was painlessly, but it's, <laughs> now it's just, it's just the way it is. And it's, it it's is successful. the way business is done. And it was a monumental lift. And uh, uh, I applaud the Bloomberg administration and the people who worked on it. Um, it is a, of a different scale. Um, containerization of trash is a very different handle than moving beer or eggs or fish or apparel. 
uh, or even last mile packages. But I think your point is land was repurposed, facilities were built, and it became the official policy and now really the unquestioned policy of New York City. The difference is the customer was a city agency, Department of Sanitation. You didn't have to persuade the private sector to use this infrastructure. You had a built-in customer, a built-in market that by fiat, by the decision of the central government, the city government, was going to have to use that infrastructure. So there wasn't as much discretion or market choice. This is involving the market and who is going to really use this, who can be compelled or induced to use it, and what are the sets of circumstances and levers that government can use to encourage that adoption. So, but excellent point. Yeah, and also the point I think that you're making about reverse logistics, I think the opportunity with e-commerce is that there's such a need to also think about reverse logistics with all those returned merchandise, like what happens with that. And so I think unlike traditional freight where, you know, a lot of things are brought into the city, but then we ship out empty containers, there might be the possibility of reverse merchandise that has to be moved out yeah. that actually might support the economics of this service in a way that's yeah. different and yeah. important. Great. Thank you all. Thank you to our panel of thought leaders and shot callers. And uh, for Hannah, all you. <laughs> <laughs>